First, uh, I would like to thank Anka and Yang for their kind uh, invitation. It's a great pleasure to be here in such a beautiful place. Uh, and I also would like uh, to thank Greg Wolf for his talk, which uh, I found really thought-provoking. I especially liked your idea of uh, history of barbarism in fragments or discontinuous history, as you said. Uh, it is true that teachers, textbooks, and even we scholars tend to sketch um, a clear cut, a linear history of the barbarians or of the concept of barbarian with uh, neatly defined stages or steps. And as w this is what you called uh, the standard version. And as you put it, uh, the barbarian was successively invented, politicized, modified, resuscitated, and abandoned over the course of antiquity. But um, as you said, this sketch, I think you said schema. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it needs to uh, be nuanced. We should be aware that, and I quote again, the barbarian was invented again and again and modified from time to time and text to text as each occasion demanded. In other words, the barbarian or the barbarians was or were not only uh, real people who took part in Greek and Roman history, who fought against Greeks and Romans, who for some of them became their subjects. They had a, a function. They were useful. This is your word and you used it uh, several times. So they were useful in Greek and Roman discourse. Some periods require the barbarians to be a threat, a negative double, you said a dark shadow. Uh, some others were not as interested in barbarians. For example, as you reminded us in Greek history, the Hellenistic period did not focus as much on barbarians as uh, the classical one. It seems like other forms of alterity mattered as much as, if not more than, the dichotomy Greeks-barbarians. And it seems like, for several reasons you mentioned, the Hellenistic kingdoms did not need barbarians so much to assert themselves, with the significant exception you mentioned of uh, Pergamum and uh, with its dying Gauls and Galatians these very well-known statues. And you also mentioned August and Rome, and that will be my, uh, my focus. Uh, and the fact, which is quite striking, that nowhere in his Res Gestae, Augustus used the word barbarus. And trying to account for these absent barbarians, quote, you said, perhaps Augustan universalism had little need of them, with a, quote, uh, with a question mark. So, as I understand it, that would be a similar similarity between Alexander's empire and subsequent Hellenistic kingdoms and Augustus's Orbis Pacatus, a shared universalism. So I would like to talk a bit more about uh, the Augustan period. Um, you said, well, you didn't actually say it now, but it's in your transcript. <laughs> you mentioned Virgil, and you said barbarians play little part in the Iron Age. So you mentioned Virgil as another evidence of this absence or diminished presence of barbarians in Augustan culture. But, uh, so, I thought about it. <laughs> Concerning the Iron Age, an explanation could be that since the plot takes place in uh, post-Trojan War times, barbarians would be anachronistic, since uh, we must keep in mind that except for the Barbarophonoi Carians, uh, there are no barbarians in Homeric epic, as you said. But still, even though uh, it is well known, for example, that in the Iron Age, Carthaginians are not depicted in negative terms, which would remind of stereotypes from uh, the Republican period. 
stereotypes that we find, as well as the word barbarous in Livy, but I shall return to Livy later. Uh, in Virgil, there is this uh, famous passage, which you have on the slide, about uh, Cleopatra and Antony in Book 8. Uh, this is the ekphrasis of Aeneas' Aen shield, where uh, the battle of Axion is depicted. And so uh, writes v Virgil, Hinc ope barbarica varis que Antonius armis victor ab aurorae populis et litore rubro, aeguptum virisque orientis et ultima secum bactra weit, sequiturque nefas aeguptia coniungs. On the other side comes Antony with barbaric might and motley arms, victorious over the nations of the dawn and the ruddy sea, bringing in his train Egypt and the strength of the east and farthers Bactra, and there follows him, oh, the shame of it, his Egyptian wife. This is not my translation. <laughs> this is from the Um So this is one of the very few occurrences of Barbarus in the Iron Age. There are very few, I agree, uh, with that. And, well, Virgil actually uses Barbaricus, which is rare instead of Barbarus, but for metrical reasons. So this is one of the very few occurrences, but uh, it is all the more striking than it is a sheer echo of Augustan, or Octavian for uh, that matter, propaganda. The confrontation is depicted as a struggle between Rome and Eastern barbarism. Cleopatra's Egyptian identity is emphasized. And so, to be sure, the Aeneid has not much to do with barbarians, but it, it's still striking that one of the few occurrences of Barbarus is precisely linked to Augustus and Augustan propaganda. Um, now, I shall move to Livy. And since they deal with uh, the first phases of Roman imperialism, imperialism, the remaining books of the Ab Urbe Condita mention many peoples labeled as barbarians, Gauls, Spanish peoples, and Spanish peoples against whom Augustus himself led a war between 26 and 24 BC, um, peoples from the Alps, Africa, peoples from the East, Thracians, Galatians, and so on. Uh, and in his work, the word, it is true that the word barbarous sometimes, often, but simply refers to uh, peoples foreign to Greek or Roman civilization whose conquest is not yet undertaken or completed. So, as I said, it would be just a label. Some peoples are barbarians and some people are Greek, Romans. Um, but most of the time, uh, the picture of the barbarians in Livy bears uh, moral and deeply negative uh, connotations and comes with many uh, stereotypes. And finally, barbarians are far from absent from Augustan art and iconography. Uh, okay. They are shown uh, defeated personified by mourning female figures on the breastplate of the Augustus of Prima Porta. This is the, the statue of Augustus. This is a very well-known statue, of course. And as you can see, the breastplate is uh, very finely uh, worked. And maybe it's better this way. And well, in the center, you can see uh, a Roman general and a Parthian uh, general giving back the standard which had been uh, taken uh, at the Battle of Karai. And on the left side and on the right side, you can see these uh, mourning female figures I just mentioned, and they are uh, Germania and Pannonia, so two uh, peoples, two provinces defeated by Augustus. So uh, that's my first example. 
Well, this one is maybe better. And uh, there are also barbarians. There are pictures, pictured, sorry, as captives on the Gemma Augustea, a cameo whose uh, central figure is a triumphing Augustus. So obviously, barbarians were present in Augustan literature and art, and Augustan propaganda and or Augustan culture did need them at some times. So, and this is a true question, since I too have been uh, puzzled for a long time by these absent barbarians of the res gestae, I would like to ask you the following question. How do you think we can reconcile these both aspects of the barbarian question in the Augustan Rome. I mean, could uh, the chronology account for the difference between the res gestae and other sources, since the res gestae being a kind of political testament that date from uh, the late years of Augustus's life, so around 1480, whereas the Aeneid, as well as what we can read from uh, Livy's work date from the last decades of the first century BC. That is to say, would Augustus's vision and or Roman vision of barbarian peoples have changed over time? Or could it only be that the res gestae aimed at different goals and that there would have been a, a coexistence of two or more kinds of discourse about barbarians at the same time? So this is a true question, and I'm very well interested in what you have to say, because it's a, it's a question which has puzzled me for a long time. Well, if I could answer briefly, um, I like your second explanation much better, that there might sure. be several <laughs> different kinds around, and um, the Virgil passage you showed, which is, that is really interesting, I hadn't thought of that before, but I suppose one of the uses of barbarian there is to... I'm sorry. One of the uses of barbarian there is to signal um, Antony's um, uh, cultural tra treason in a way, by marking Antony as not a Roman opponent destroyed, so to remove the animus of civil war by making him more barbaric. And um, but I, 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 I'm also quite intrigued by the one, by wondering if there are, if we tell different stories with different media. Because alongside the, the images you showed, the, the Prima Porta statue and the Gemma Augusta, we could think about uh, the Tropeum on the Alps and others like that. And I, th I think if we, told, if we tell a story from pictures alone, we get a really different story yeah, than the one we do from text. And the, sure. the difficulty that people like me, who are trained as classicists, philologists and historians, is we, we make the story first from the text, and then we try and illustrate it. And I think... We get, actually, we get different stories from these different media. But, but yes, I think I, I, I'm attracted to your second answer that in Augustan Rome, which is a big place in a long time, there are many different discourses. There's no unitary discourse about, about the barbarian. Yeah, but still, these absent barbarians in the res gestae, well... It surprised me, yes. yes I was amazed. So it's, you don't have an answer? Well, uh, <laughs> um, it doesn't do the same... You know, if you read the Nicolae of you, you imagine that sure. Strabo and the Reis Gestae and the census, that they all illustrate aspects of a single unitary sure. view. And it's a wonderful book. But in this particular instance, we need to nuance it. OK. So thank thank you. you very much for thank your comments. Thank you very much. What, do we still have time? Or I guess no. Oh, sorry. Thank you to everybody so far, but just one f uh, explanation of the race gestae. Uh, Augustus, in the, toward the end of his life, was concerned to demonstrate that Rome now governed the world. There was a place it didn't govern, and that was Parthia. But as you show on that uh, shield, oh, I'm sorry, on the breastplate, 
you have the return of the standards placed between two Roman victories. Augustus reconstituted the new uh, ideology of peace, which he also believes in, the Arapakis, the worship of a goddess of peace, as a sign that Rome has now conquered everything and has incorporated everything. And in that context, he wants to avoid this radical discrimination between us and them. So it's a move that I think has occurred posterior to the Aeneid, but it represents a kind of controlled yeah. ideology that um, is reflected both in the breastplate and in the res gestae. Okay, okay. thank, thank you. you. Well, more to say. <laughs> no, I would have more to say, but I think since we are short of time and this would take too much time, so maybe we can keep it for <laughs> further discussion around lunch or so on. Okay. Thank you very much. Thank you.